Okay, so today we have with us Miter Lair. She's from Oregon Health and Science University. She just defended her PhD dissertation this summer. Mm -hmm. And um, she is in the Center for Spoken Language Understanding, CSLU. She has worked on speech technology for a number of years, including work at VICOM at uh, San Sebastian, Spain. And uh, she's also worked at Nuance in 2013, last year she was there, and she was at the Johns Hopkins University uh, summer, prestigious summer workshop um, for speech and language analysis. So um, she, her research is in the area of speech recognition and general language uh, processing and also statistical learning methods, but she has had exposure to language understanding techniques uh, for example, uh, paraphrase techniques for narrative uh, retelling assessments. So um, without further ado, I'd like to hand the podium over to Miter. Thank okay. you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, today I am going to talk about my research uh, thesis that is related to discriminative joint modeling of acoustic and lexical variations for speech recognition or for spoken language process. First, I'll give a brief overview about the research projects I've been working on. Then I'll focus on the automated narrative, uh, automated assessment of the narrative uh, retelling tasks. And there, uh, I'll talk about the case scenario where we have uh, evaluated uh, our techniques, that is the Wessler logical memory task. After that, I'll talk about the work we ha have done in discriminative pronunciation modeling. And finally, I'll mention some future work. The main research areas I've been working on is the joint discriminative modeling for speech recognition and the automated assessment of narrative retelling tasks. The idea of the joint discriminative modeling uh, for speech recognition lies in uh, training discriminative linear models with features that belong to different components of the speech recognizer jointly by directly minimizing the recognition error rate. And we have focused on uh, engram kind uh, features. In the first part of the work, we have uh, applied these discriminative linear models to improve the performance of the gay Arabic transcription task. And there, we, we train models with engrams of acoustic states from the acoustic models and engrams of words from the language model. And we also incorporated features related to duration model that uh, they are, uh, that is an information that is usually ignored in current speech recognizer. This work uh, was presented in ICAS 2010 and we also published uh, a journal about this work. Then, uh, in the second part of the work, we applied the, our discriminative linear models to adapt an out-of-dialect out of speech recognizer to recognize uh, dialectal speech, in particular to recognize African-American English speech. In this case, the features are uh, related to phonetic transformations, and we also explored features uh, from the acoustic models. And uh, we are going to present this work in InterSpeech from this year. And finally, the last part of the work uh, was about um, training uh, or presenting systems to automate uh, the assessment of narrative retelling tasks. And uh, we presented this work in NACOL from, from 2013. Narrative production tasks in general can be seen in several uh, uh, fields. For example, in they are part of many neuropsychological tests and also in read reading comprehension tests. But the, the drawback of using narrative production tasks is that they are very time consuming and uh, the personal component demand is very high. So automating the the administration of this uh, task uh, will provide a way of, uh, of uh, being more accessible to everyone and reducing uh, the cost of uh, applying these uh, techniques. 
and uh, as it will be, like as I said, faster and more inexpensive. An automated system uh, will have the following mo uh, modules. So first, uh, we have at the front end the speech recognizer that takes the narrative retelling and outputs the noisy transcripts of the retelling. Then this transcript is uh, fed into the scoring system and the scoring system will assign a score to the retelling uh, according to, to the guidelines of the test. Uh, so in this case, the scoring system will have to capture the acoustic confusions from the speech recognizer and also the lexical variations or paraphrasing from the narrative retelling. Our case scenario, as I said before, is the Wessler logical memory task. And in this, uh, this is a subset from the Wessler memo memory scale and is used to assess the memory function in adults. And it has been shown that uh, a poor performance uh, in this uh, task is a, poor uh, is a good indicator of mild cognitive impairment. In this uh, test, the subject listened to the narrative or to the clinician reads a uh, read and narrative. And then the subject has to recall the narrative just after hearing the, hearing the narrative and after 20, 30 minutes of unrelated activities. And the clinician uh, scores these uh, this retellings according to how many of the uh, how many story elements the subject recalls out of a predefined list of 25 story elements. The box from the top represents the source narrative that the clinician reads with the 25 story elements uh, uh, separated by backslashes, and then the uh, box from the bottom is an uh, example retelling with the recalled story elements uh, underlined. As I said, the clinician uh, will count the recalled uh, story elements, and in this example, this retelling will get a score of uh, 12 out of 25. And the clinical uh, specification guidelines uh, indicates which of the variations are allowed. So for example, for the story element ANA, it is allowed uh, any uh, name variation of ANA. So for example, AN will be a uh, allowed uh, variation. Or uh, for the story element employed, if the subject said work, is also an allowed uh, variation. In previous work, Prudomo and Rourke presented an automated scoring system uh, for narrative retelling based on word alignment models, similar to the ones that are used for machine translation, but uh, in this case, we don't have uh, to align two different languages. What they aligned was the source narrative with the retellings, and they built the models uh, in an unsupervised way. In order to get a fully automated system, uh, we later incorporated the speech recognizer into the pipeline, and uh, we used the one best transcript from the speech recognizer uh, to, to run the experiment. And we saw that the word alignment-based uh, scoring systems perform well for low error rate scenarios, but the performance degrade uh, significantly in high error rate scenarios. So in, in this case, uh, if we, if we uh, score this uh, example with the word alignment model, we will get a score of 17 out of 25. The word alignment model considers uh, that if any of the content words from a story element is uh, aligned with any con the content words from the retelling, uh, it considers that that story element was uh, recalled. So for example, here, the story element Thompson was uh, aligned with, uh, with Tyler, so the system considers that this story element was recalled when this is an error. As an alternative, uh, and in order to make a, a scoring system more robo robust to the recognition errors, we proposed a to build a scoring model based on word tagging models. So here the idea is uh, to, uh, to build a log-linear model 
with uh, input sequences of this form. So the input sequence is a sequence of uh, words. And uh, these words will be manual transcript, uh, one best speech recognizer, or a bin of words uh, extracted from the word confusion networks from the speech uh, recognizer. So each bin con uh, contains the possible word candidates for that position in the sequence. And uh, what we did is for, uh, for the output sequence, define a set of 25 uh, tags plus another tag uh, zero to represent uh, the words that don't belong to any story element. So the tags from one to 25 uh, represent each of the story element and then zero represent that the word doesn't belong to any story element. This is the form of the, wall lo of the log linear model that we train. And uh, to train the model, we need to define a set of features phi. And uh, we need to learn the parameters lambda for each of these uh, features. And uh, the model is trained by maximizing this uh, conditional probability. Uh, in our case, we are going to generate a sequence of vectors for the input sequence. And these uh, vectors have the dimension of the vocabulary size. And uh, each element in the vector is representing one of the words from the, for the, from the vocabulary. So in the case of using manual transcripts or one best uh, transcript, just one of the elements from the vector is going to set to one. But if we are using uh, word confusion beans from the confusion networks, we will have to want all the words from the bin. And we explored different kind of features to train our models. We used the context independent features uh, extracted from the input side, uh, context dependent features from the input side. So in this case, we take into account the previous word and the following word in the input sequence. And uh, also we explored the Markov order zero features where you just take into account the tag of the current word and uh, Markov order one features where you take into account the current tag and the previous tag. Uh, as uh, some of the story elements are uh, multi-word uh, elements, it, uh, apart from just using the simple tagging uh, of saying if the word belongs to that to one story element or not, we also explore the bio tagging, where you you apart from saying if the word belong to the story element, you also specify if the word is in the beginning of the story element or inside of the story element. The corpus we used for our experiments was collected as part of the longitudinal study on brain aging at OHSU Leighton Center. And um, the, speak, the subjects were uh, diagnosed with uh, mild cognitive impairment or not with the clinical dementia rating. And a clinical dementia rating of zero means that it's typical aging, um, mild cognitive and a clinical, clinical dementia rating of 0 0.5 means that uh, it is diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. The good thing of the clinical dementia rating is uh, it has a strong expert inter annotator reliability and uh, the diagnosis uh, doesn't rely in any narrative retelling test. Our training set contains uh, retellings from 144 uh, subjects and uh, 36 of them uh, are diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. And the test set contains retellings from 70 subjects, and 35 of them are diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. Uh, the speech recognizer that we used was trained with, uh, uh, with English broadcast news data. The acoustic models were trained with 430 hours of speech, and then the language model was uh, a four-gram language model. And if we use the baseline speech recognizer, the word error rate is kind of high, as we can see, it's 47.2%. If we run a maximum likelihood linear regression acoustic model adaptation with the, our training data, we improve the word error rate until 38.2. 
if we run a adaptation of the language model, we uh, the improvement is like almost uh, ten percent. And if we fully adapt it, if we fully adapt the speech recognizer, we get a water rate of twenty five point six percent. So these are some of the results of the scoring system. Uh, the y-axis is representing the f-score of the detected uh, story element. The x-axis is the water rate, where a zero uh, water rate means that we used manual transcripts. And then, uh, so these are maximum entropy classifier and conditional random field model. The difference is here we just have a, a Markov order zero features, and here Markov order one and Markov order zero features. And um, the blue lines are uh, when we just use context independent features from the input side, and the purple lines uh, when we use context independent and context dependent features. And then the difference between the dark and the light line is that the dark one is uh, just when we use the one best transcript and the light one when we use uh, word confusion networks. Uh, from here, you can see that the conditional random fields uh, perform significantly better than the maximum entropy classifier when we use context independent features, but when we use context-dependent features, the performance is kind of similar. And then um, the work using work confusion networks that is taking into account more than just the one best transcript from the speech recognizer is, uh, in our case at least, is just useful when the word error rate is uh, high. For a fully adapted speech recognizer, we didn't find uh, very uh, relevant to use word confusion networks. As uh, in order to uh, combine the strengths, of, the strengths of the word alignment model and the word tagging model that we proposed here, uh, we decided to explore some combinations of both uh, models. So the, the good thing of the word alignment model is that uh, it's unsupervised, you don't need any manual tags but uh, it's not very flexible to include um, a distribution of candidates for the, from the speech recognizer, and it's a generative model. But uh, as opposed to our log linear model, where uh, it is discriminative model, it has more flexibility to include diverse kind of features, but the bad thing is that uh, it's supervised training. So the two, uh, two um, scenarios that we explored to combine these two models were the unsupervised discriminative tagger and the discriminative tagger with the word alignment derived features. In the first case, what we did was uh, to, instead of using the manual uh, tags, to use the tags that the word alignment out, uh, model outputs. In this case, so we will be training with noisy tags. And the second approach was to use manual tags for the training and include the word alignment output as an extra feature into our discriminative model. So this is the case when we just use context independent features and uh, the green lights are when we use the, word, the output of the word alignment model as an extra feature. And the blue one is uh, when we use the, uh, the, word alignment, the output of the word alignment model uh, as tags for training the, language, the log linear model, at that the purple, and the blue one is what I showed before, the supervised uh, log linear model. And uh, we see that uh, this uh, scenario, this model uh, is the most robust one, that is when we include the output of the word linear, of the word alignment model as a feature, and uh, it's robust in even in high word error rate uh, scenarios. And then uh, the unsupervised uh, discriminative model performs worse uh, as expected, but still is kind of comparable to the supervised uh, model. 
And this is the same uh, uh, scenario as before, but uh, using context uh, dependent features. Uh, we can, I think, conclude the same, the same things. As, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Wessler logical, uh, it has been shown that uh, a poor performance in the Wessler logical memory test is a good indicator of mild uh, cognitive impairment. So uh, after detecting the story elements, we decided to apply uh, these story elements to classify uh, if the subject uh, has, uh, can, could have mild cognitive impairment or not as uh, they previously done, uh, did uh, Emily uh, Tucker and Brian Rourke. The mild cognitive impairment is the earliest identifiable stage of the cognitive decline, and it's uh, clinically significant, but it doesn't uh, usually interfere in the daily, li daily uh, li living activities. And, uh, it is diagnosed by uh, interviews with the patient and one of the family members at regular intervals, and is often a precursor of Alzheimer and other dementias. So what we did was to train a sub, uh, support vector machine with the story element feature vectors, and uh, these feature vectors contain uh, 52 elements per subject. So two elements per story element, one from the immediate retelling and the other one from the delayed retelling, and then two extra features representing the total score of the immediate and delayed uh, retelling. And uh, we test uh, the automatically derived scores uh, with this support vector machine, and uh, we evaluate uh, with the area under the curve. The curve where uh, uh, the values go, goes from zero to one. And one means that the classification was uh, perfect and zero that it was totally grown. We used uh, the maximum entropy models and the conditional random field models. And in this case also, uh, we can say the same as uh, for detecting the story elements that uh, the classif uh, when using con uh, work on fusion networks, the classification uh, performs better than when we just use the one best transcript. And the best system was uh, using the hybrid model, that is when we use the word alignment uh, output as features, and uh, with the fully adapted uh, speech recognizer. In this case, we get uh, a classification score of uh, 0.79, that is uh, quite close to the score obtained with the manual transcript, that is uh, 0.82. And uh, here it doesn't appear, but the score that we got with the manual, uh, manually detected story elements, it was uh, 0.83. As a summary, uh, we proposed an alternative scoring model to the word alignment model that it was based on word tagging systems and it's uh, discriminative in nature and it has flexibility to include a diverse kind of features. So that, uh, that gives, gives us freedom to be able to better capture uh, paraphrasing and uh, acoustic confusion from the speech recognizer. The problem is that it was a supervised model, so we need manual tags. And here I mentioned that uh, we didn't, uh, I didn't show in the result, but we didn't get any benefits from using just uh, EO tagging or BO tagging. It may be that we didn't have uh, a lot of data to capture this discrimination. So uh, in order uh, to combine the strengths of the word alignment model and uh, our log linear model, we explored two new scenarios. That one was the unsupervised discriminative model, where we used the output of the word alignment model uh, to get the tags. And the other one, the hybrid supervised uh, model, where we include the output of the word alignment model as extra features. And this one uh, gave us the best results. 
Now I'll switch to the work we've done on the discriminative pronunciation model. And first, uh, I'll provide so, some background of speech uh, recognition. So the goal of the speech recognition is to, uh, take, to get the word sequence that maximizes uh, the posterior probability of the word sequence given the input sequence among all the candidates from the search space T. And this uh, probability can be written, written by bias rule uh, as a product of two distributions divided by, uh, by the probability of the input sequence. And uh, uh, for the R max, we don't need uh, these probabilities, so we can just keep these two probabilities. And the first probability is represented with the acoustic models and the second one with the language model. In large vocabulary speech recognizers, the acoustic models are represented uh, with context-dependent uh, fonts. So we need to, this uh, probability is split in three probabilities. The first one is represented with the acoustic models. The second one is, uh, are the context-dependent decision trees that map uh, context-dependent fonts into context-independent fonts. And finally, the third probability is the pronunciation lexicon that maps the words into the, their phonetic transcription. The acoustic models are re the composed in the emission model and the transition model. Traditionally, the emission models have been represented with Gaussian mister models, but uh, lately, the uh, deep neural networks uh, are starting to be used uh, due to their better performance. Independently of the emission model that we use, the transition model is represented with the uh, hidden Markov models. As I said, the acoustics are represented uh, with context-dependent fonts, uh, and in particular, each context-dependent font is represented with three hidden Markov model states. The first one is representing the initial part of the font, the second one, the middle part of the phone, and finally the third state, state, the acoustics of the final part of the phone. As it is not possible to train a, a model for each context-dependent phone that we have, uh, since the, 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 there are not enough uh, occurrences of all the context-dependent phones in the training data, what we do is to uh, cluster the context-dependent phones and uh, learn a model uh, for all the, the context-dependent fonts that share the cluster. And uh, the clusters are obtained by gr growing decision trees. So in the beginning, you have here uh, all the context-dependent fonts that share the central font. And then you start uh, asking questions, phonological questions. And in the end, you get uh, the context-dependent fonts in clusters. These uh, clusters uh, are called tight states, allo allophone states, acoustic states. So the idea is that all the context-dependent fonts that fall in the same cluster will share the same GMM, for example. And finally, the pronunciation lexicon is just a phonetic representation of the words. And uh, usually, it's the canonical uh, phonetic uh, representation. It may contain a couple more variants, but not uh, many. The language models uh, are used to con constrain the search space uh, that the acoustic models uh, provide. And uh, they represent the probability of the current word given the history. In the case of the n-gram language models, uh, this history is like the previous n minus one uh, words. The n-gram language models are the most popular uh, language models that are used, and in, uh, they are very simple to train. You just count the occurrences of the n-grams, and uh, then you divide uh, by the occurrences of the history of that n-gram. And to avoid having a zero probability for some n-grams, uh, some smoothing techniques are applied. And recently, uh, neural network-based language models uh, have regained interest in the form of feed-forward neural network language models or recurrent, um, recurrent uh, neural networks language models. 
it is not uh, feasible to train a speech recognizer for each uh, task uh, or domain that we have. So adaptation techniques uh, are applied instead. instead. When we have a, a new task, we can have a mismatches at acoustic level because we have different uh, environment or um, acoust different acoustic environment or channel. We can have mismatch at pronunciation level uh, due to different uh, speaking styles, or we can have a, a mismatch at language model language uh, level, for example, because we are. Uh, uh, we can have red speech versus spontaneous speech. One of the current issues in speech recognition is uh, recognizing dialectal or accented speech. And in this case, the mismatches mainly occur, occur in the pronunciation level. Pronunciation is modeled in a speech recognizer with the uh, context dependent fonts at acoustic modeling model and uh, uh, with. Uh, with the pronunciation lexicon. The uh, previous approaches have uh, used the uh, maximum likelihood linear regression or maximum a posteriori techniques to adapt the acoustic models, or they have also uh, done a context dependent decision tree modifications. And uh, there are many papers also. Uh, on explaining how to add new phonetic pronunciations into the lexicon. What we propose instead is to train a discriminative pronunciation modeling. That uh, what uh, the idea is that this pronunciation modeling captures the phonetic transformations that exist between the canonical pronunciations of the lexicon and the pronunciation of the uh, dialectal speech. So think about the model like this. The idea is that uh, this model will, will map the uh, surface phone, that is how the phone is pronounced by the dialectal speaker, into the canonical phone. That is how it is represented in the, uh, in the pronunciation lexicon. And uh, we, with the discriminative model, we will learn weights for this uh, phon pronunciation, uh, for these font transformations. We applied the uh, global linear models for our discriminative models. And uh, the global linear models are just a linear combination of features with their weights. Here, you have to define the set of features you are going to use. And you need to learn the uh, parameters alpha. And uh, the model will uh, pick the Y output uh, among all the possible candidates that minimizes uh, this cost. Well, and here is just to say that uh, there is a choice of including the baseline score of the speech recognizer into the training or using later. So we use later externally to combine the score of the discriminative model with the baseline score. And uh, we trained our models with the perceptron algorithm. And uh, the idea of the perceptron algorithm is to uh, penalize the features of the one best uh, candidate that doesn't match the oracle candidate. The oracle candidate is the candidate with the minimum word error rate and uh, rewards the features from the oracle candidate. So if we have a list of uh, possible uh, transcripts of candidates for the given input speech, what we want is to push down in the list this uh, best scoring candidate down because it's incorrect and push up this uh, candidate that is the one that has the minimum uh, word error rate. So we will penalize the features from this candidate and we will reward the features from this candidate. We ran the experiments uh, with that data from the historical project. And uh, this, is, uh, this uh, data contains uh, a speech from African-American uh, English speakers. And uh, we also ran in parallel the same experiments uh, on standard American English uh, uh, data. So to see if our uh, models perform 
or give more gain on the dialectal, on the African-American speech than on the standard American speech. Both are from Storycorps uh, project. And both uh, data uh, have, uh, on both cases, the training data has uh, 13 hours and uh, the test data three hours. And in this case, the out of dialect speech recognizer that we used um, uh, was trained with IBM Toolkit and the acoustic models were trained with one, uh, 430 hours of uh, English broadcast news data uh, and it has uh, 44,000 acoustic states and 45 uh, fonts. And the language model is a foreground language model with a vocabulary of 48k words and it was trained with English uh, conversational telephone speech data. And this uh, speech recognizer uh, was uh, like refined with several passes where you apply vocal tract length normalization, uh, speaker adaptation, and finally some um, uh, discriminative model of the acoustic models, discriminative training of the acoustic models. We, uh, instead of uh, learning the font transformation from the data, that that would be another choice, uh, we instead use um, no, we use knowledge-based uh, phonological rules to extract the uh, font transformations. And this uh, set of uh, rules was uh, provided by Kyle Gorman, that is a professor in our department. And we, so we applied these rules to extract the transformations. And the idea was to train with our, to learn with our discriminative model the weight for these uh, transformations. As uh, we applied our discriminative model in a rescoring mode, uh, we extracted uh, embed lists from the lattices of the speech recognizer, and each uh, candidate in, it, in this embed list has the word sequence and the sequence uh, of canonical forms that are obtained by first aligning the, um, the word sequence with the uh, canonical pronunciation lexicon. As uh, instead of just having uh, this canonical font sequence, what we want is to have a sequence of font transformation. We need to extract also the surface font sequence that is represented, representing how the uh, dialectal speakers pronounce this word sequence. And for that, what we did is to create an extended lexicon. So we took the canonical uh, lexicon and we apply the phon uh, phonological rules from the table. And once we apply this rule, we generate new pronunciations for the words. So in this case, we will have a new pronunciation for the word I and another new pronunciation for the word the. And then what we did is run to run the first alignment with this new extended lexicon to obtain the new uh, surface phone sequence. And then to get the font transformation, we just run Levenstein uh, distance alignment between these two uh, font sequences. So the features, uh, the kind of features that we use for our uh, linear model are uh, engrams of font uh, transformation, like of this kind. And uh, we extracted 100 best candidates, both for training and for testing. And we used uh, bigrams and unigrams of the of uh, phonetic, and then I will explain acoustic state features. And uh, we ran the experiments, as I said, in parallel, both, both in the African American English data and standard American English rate data. And the uh, statistical significance. Uh, was computed with respect to the baseline using the match pair test. These are the results. So here we can, uh, well, this is for the African American English data and this is for the standard American English data. And the baseline, uh, this is the word error rate of the out of dialect speech recognizer in both data sets. And we can see that the uh, out of dialect speech recognizer performs over 10% worse on the African American English data than on the standard American English data. And uh, well, these are just the, the features 
from our discriminative models and the number of features that were activated in the test set from this uh, from our discriminative model. So when we apply the phonetic uh, phonetic um, discriminative model, we improve the uh, word error rate in uh, one point. I think like 1.3% on the African American English data and just uh, 0 0.2 for the standard American English. That is what we were, uh, we were expecting since the font transformation should be uh, characteristic of the African American English data, not the standard American English data. We performed uh, another experiment that was just using the canonical font sequences. So engrams extracted from the canonical font sequences and we saw that actually the using font transformation was not helping us. Like using just the canonical uh, font sequence uh, was giving the same performance. Uh, just mentioned that uh, this, uh, the data set we used uh, is a subset, subset of the data set that uh, Chen used, uh, Nancy Chen used for her uh, PhD research thesis but in her work, the idea was to recognize the dialect instead of doing a dialectal speech recognition. As I, I mentioned, the uh, pronunciation is uh, also modeled with the acoustic models by uh, representing the acoustic at the context-dependent uh, phone level. And uh, so we decided to uh, train our discriminative models with engram from the acoustic state. So the acoustic states are uh, this sequence of numbers, and each uh, number here is representing a, a GMM uh, from, the, the, from the acoustic models. Uh, so um, uh, we extracted again the embed list but in, uh, from the lattices, but in this case we extract the, the sequence of the acoustic states. And in this case, uh, the discriminative model trained with the acoustic states perform a little bit better than with the phonetic features. And uh, this, uh, actually, the, the discriminative model at acoustic state level uh, also performs better in the, in the case of the standard American English data. But that could be also because the, uh, uh, the features at the acoustic state level, they are not just uh, bringing information about the pronunciation, but also uh, about the channel and the acoustic environment. And finally, uh, what we decided to do is to apply our discriminative models on top of a generative uh, acoustic model adaptation. So it's very common to, when you have a dialectal or accented speech recognition to run maximum likelihood linear uh, adaptation of the acoustic models. So we, done, we did uh, this MLLR adaptation with uh, standard American English training data and with the African American English training data. So when we do the MLLR with the standard American English data, uh, we will be adapting the channel mismatch but not pronunciation mismatch since this uh, data should be, the pronunciation of this data should be close to the one of the speech recognizer. But in the case of uh, running uh, MLLR with the African American English data, apart from uh, the channel mismatch, we, sh we should be also adapting some uh, pronunciation mismatches. The interesting thing here is that uh, when we adapt uh, the acoustic models with the African American English data, our discriminative models still give uh, further improvements of top of, on top of that, those adapted models. Uh, we see that here we have 0.5, 0.7% improvement. Some related work uh, to, our, to, what, uh, to our research is the one from Giotti, Fosler, Lucier, and Libescu, where uh, they discriminatively train the parameters from the arcs uh, that represent the weighty finite state transducer based uh, pronunciation lexicon and they provide the framework uh, to be able to jointly learn not just the parameters from the WFST lexicon but also other components of the speech recognizer. 
they, in their case, they evaluate their approach in the switchboard conversational speech corpus, and they found um, improvements on isolated speech recognition, but not uh, continuous speech uh, recognition. In this case, they were not trying to learn new variations, but they were just training, uh, learning the weights or refining the weights for the existing uh, canonical pronunciation lexicon. And uh, another work is the one from Karana, Suivon, Laverne, and Lamel, that in this case also uh, they, try, they train discriminatively a pronunciation variation model, but uh, in, this, uh, in their approach they just train a unigram, uh, a unigram features as opposed to unigrams and bigram features. And they optimize their, their discriminative model uh, by minimizing the phone edit distance uh, as opposed to our case that we train by optimizing the word error rate. So as a summary, uh, uh, our discriminative pronunciation model uh, provides improvement of 1.3, 1.5% of the African-American test set. And uh, as expected, they provide uh, less gain on the standard American English test set, just the 0.1, 0.6%. And even when we adapt the Gaussian mixture models from the acoustic models with the African-American English data, our discriminative models still provide the further gains. And uh, I didn't show these results, but uh, we tried uh, training discriminative models with both uh, phonetic features and acoustic state features, and uh, it didn't provide further gains, like the gains from the acoustic state features and from the phonetic features were not uh, complementary. Uh, so, well, uh, here just as a summary, say that maybe the acoustic state uh, uh, features are uh, better in capturing a more fine grain co-articulation effects and uh, the phonetic uh, features uh, so are um, can be useful, for example, not in this case that we use knowledge-based uh, phonetic features, but can be useful to detect some kind of uh, phonological rules or phonetic transformation from some cohort of people that we don't know what is the pattern, the pronunciation pattern of them. And uh, some future work, for example, in the case of automating the assessment of the uh, narrative retelling task will be maybe to migrate from the uh, discriminative linear model to the discriminative non-linear models, uh, specifically neural networks, because uh, lately people are uh, using uh, neural networks as opposed to conditional random fields for semantic uh, understanding applications. And uh, another future work will be to uh, use more complex phonetic features since we saw that uh, right now our phonetic uh, transformation don't provide uh, more gains uh, over just using canonical uh, phonetic uh, features. And then uh, learning data-driven phonetic transformations. And I want to thank uh, all these people. <laughs> uh, questions? Okay, we have time for questions. I have a lot myself, um, uh, but maybe I should give someone else a chance first. Anybody? Micah. Go first. I have, I have a number as well. I'll have to take turns. I know, sir. Which one to start with? Um, I guess a, a fairly simple one to start with. <clears throat> In the trade off between using the phonetic features and the acoustic features, um, What's the relative cost uh, computationally of using the acoustic features? It seemed in several cases the acoustic features gave you at least as good, if not better, results. I'm um, just curious what the overhead is on simply using the acoustic features versus having to run the phonetic recognition over the same audio stream. Uh, it's not uh, much work uh, to just uh, run the forced alignment to get the phonetic features. Uh, but yeah, uh, you need a little bit further processing, but it's kind of straightforward. And then, uh, like the 
acoustic, the feature set with the acoustic state is uh, bigger than the feature set with the phonetic, uh, with the phonetic transformation. So maybe if you want a small footprint uh, feature set, you will use uh, phonetic features. And if you don't care so much about the size of the, of the model, you can use that. So, but the it's, complexity it's still, class is the same between, so I understand, so the feature set's larger with the acoustic the, features, but, but the underlying model is essentially the same complexity. It, no, the, uh, so the complexity, the, the model of, with the acoustic state feature has more, uh, more parameters, it's more complex. So the parameters are more parameters to learn because you have more features. But the learning algorithm is essentially yes, the same. Yes, the learning algorithm is totally the same. It may take a little bit more time to learn, maybe more iterations, or, but the algorithm is totally the same. It's like the discriminative linear model and trained with the perceptron algorithm. Yeah. Ian looked like he had a question too. Let me just ask something. So for the, um, first for the, uh, retelling task, um, the assessment of the retelling, you talked about an F score, which takes into account both false positives and false negatives. And I was wondering which of those two uh, has the highest impact? That is, um, would the score be higher with higher precision? Would the score be higher? Yeah, you know, is the uh, precision hurting you or is the recall hurting you? And also, in this task, which one of those is the most important? I mean, is it important to recall everything you can even at the expense of precision or mm, vice yeah. versa? I would say that uh, we were uh, lacking of recall. The recall in some of the story elements uh, was kind of uh, low, lower than the precision. And uh, I remember that when we included the context dependent uh, uh, features, we improved uh, especially the recall. So that uh, the improving the recall was really helpful because uh, context-dependent features. Is recall the most important? I mean, it's it's often task uh, uh, for sure. Specific. The, the precision also is important, but in this case, I think it was important to increase the recall that in many of the story elements was kind of low. Right. So false but, negatives are uh, bad. But we didn't bad. Uh, do uh, much um, analysis on trying to see how. Uh, each one impact in our uh, final F score. Okay. All right. I have more questions, but I'll pass it around. Ian, no? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I saw that you got like an 80% um, accuracy in classifying the cognitive impairments, and I was wondering what the accuracy of a doctor uh, or someone trained in the field is. To uh, we to used the. Uh, yes, it's not, but uh, it's not either uh, totally. Like, uh, I cannot tell you uh, what is the accuracy of a, uh, of a clinician uh, scoring the system. The closest I can say is uh, that with the manual uh, scores, we got a, a classification of 0.83. But yes, I, I cannot tell you with a human uh, what will be the classification. So it was, right, I remember the 83, that was a manual task versus the machine, and you're saying there was a difference of two uh, or three Yes, uh, I, it okay. was uh, with the manual scores, so extracted from a clinician, was uh, 0.83, instead of up, as opposed to extracted automatically. But, uh, so. Okay. Uh, out of curiosity, on the, the last third of the presentation on the, the dialect uh, uh, improvement, have you thought about applying this and how do you think it would work for improvement on a single subject? So obviously, things, especially things like dialect, you're really limited by in any of these training models by the particular population you happen to measure and the, the data set you have and really depending on how tightly clusters are and how separate they are, that's going to uh, definitely affect how good you are at identifying any one particular person's dialect or recognizing their variant within the, the learned space. But what about tuning for an individual subject? Do you, do you think, so you, your recognition rates went from uh, between 95 and 
86, 87, it looked like. I was just curious how well that would do when only dealing with a corpus from an individual subject. I think it should be, it depends on how much. So if I have 13 hours of uh, an individual uh, subject, I would say that I should also see significant gains uh, because, uh, uh, and maybe more because you are uh, 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 learning more uh, exactly the features, uh, the pronunciation features for that individual uh, speaker. In this case, we have a mixture of African American English speakers where some people, I'm sure, they have a more pronounced, uh, a more um, uh, significant pronunciation of the dialect. Others maybe are not so, uh, are closer to the standard American English uh, pronunciation. Then also, uh, they are diverse uh, ages of, on this uh, cohort of people, like some of young, others are old. So I guess it will be more uh, refined for just for one individual person. The problem is always that there is no usually enough data for just one person. Uh, well, you get to collect the average. Yeah. Right. How, how many hours do you need? You need 13? Well, in this case, we had 13 and we used 13. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where is the threshold, but I would say that mm, um, less, mm, well, maybe for just one subject, I would, it would be possible maybe a little bit less yeah. because you were easier, uh, you would be able to learn easier. The It'll be light. a little overtuned. Yes, yeah, yes. You wouldn't use that same machine for other people. Yes, no. That is so true. I'm kind of something piggybacking on that question, although it won't sound like it at first when I start the question. So um, it, it looked to me that you have predictable, I mean, you got from somebody in your department these SAE, AAVE transformations, mm -hmm. and um, which is really cool. Um, is it the case that you, and you said you could learn these, you could try to learn these, of course you'd have a lot of noise if yes. you did that. Um, did you do any experiments to determine that you would do better with uh, these sort of predictable transformations than if you had no such transformations? Yeah, I, that is something that I wanted to try, like uh, not, uh, not defining any uh, rule from the beginning and just train with the, the, from the data the, the transformation. And I, I, for sure we will learn many noisy transformations, but the discriminative model should take care of uh, assigning relevant weights just to the transformations that are uh, relevant and not like put to zero to a very uh, low weight the transformation that we shouldn't take into account there. Okay, yeah, and back to the single person training, the reason I'm thinking about this with these phonological characteristics is that it could be that with certain types of um, impairments that there are predictable transformations that occur within a particular human being over the course of time, mm -hmm. say over two to three years, but still the same human. But if you knew that in advance, if you knew the types of degradation that could yeah, occur. That would uh, make it easier. Uh, Okay, and so, yeah, I mean, I can think of a lot of things to talk about with respect to that, so. A concrete example of that in a non, in a normative case would be someone relocating. You know, when you begin to slowly adapt to the, the dialect of your new region, and there it's not, you don't have Alzheimer's or another degenerative type of condition, but you know, your, your pronunciation and phonetics are, are changing over an extended period of time, but rapid enough that um, not only could be measured, but if you talk to people you haven't talked to in six months, they'll think you talk different. Yeah, um, uh, do you think your has American speech? <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a bit more, he moves so much that he, he is a mush, <laughs> like I'm so hard. many. Um, uh, Want to talk about sort of the non-phonetic uh, acoustic features, uh, starting first with the, the MCI. Uh, has anyone looked or, or in your data set, was there any uh, other acoustic features that distinguish the MCI from non-MCI patients? Uh, uh, different cadence, different volume levels? Yes, uh, I mean, definitely there must be some uh, 
differences. We didn't include uh, acoustic related features, just uh, the, the story element, but there are, uh, there are many other kind of features that you include, you can include in the classification, like the acoustic related features, uh, also uh, how many, the, how many times they use uh, paraphrasing that I guess it will be also maybe people with MCI they don't use so much paraphrasing. I'm not sure, I am just guessing. Or how many words uh, they use for in the retellings. There are many kind of uh, features. How, how much, I'm just saying curiosity, how much do you think uh, do sort of effective and emotional features of the audio stream? Does that affect the, the word recognition error rate Oh, and is it possible to for if you have if you have a well trained system for a single person, mm -hmm. can you uh, look at um, uh, effective states, uh, amount of energy in the voice um, by looking at? Uh, can you separate that out from the the word recognition? Uh, separate the acoustic features from the linguistic features. Uh, Co correct. So based based on yes. on the training the the, the, the training of the uh, word recognizer, can you, can you essentially tell that it's the same word, but, but the audio is somehow fundamentally different Different. the way you could classify? Uh, mm, yes, you could include, I guess, uh, as other, uh, like uh, as extra features, uh, duration of the word, or uh, I think people also uh, have studied like pitch, or pitch feature, that also is relevant. And uh, I'm not sure on my cognitive impairment, but I know that uh, in uh, depression, depression detection, uh, I think acoustic features were more relevant than the linguistic ones. Well, that too, like, in things like deception, you typically have a higher frequency, a uh, slightly faster rate of speech than mm -hmm. in non-deceptive, yeah. um, besides maybe the content-related The features. Ne more neutral speech if you are more depressed or instead of with more uh, pitch variations or frequency. My question is more about so uh, the classification of um, African-American vernacular English as a distinct dialect as opposed to a distinct language, which would have its own fully formed grammar. Mm -hmm. yes. would, that ha would it have an impact on your results if you used a, a distinct grammar instead of just uh, phonological like, characteristics? I didn't include uh, here the results, but uh, like together with the pronunciation related features, we also learned features from the language model and they uh, were provided uh, still uh, for their gains. But I have the feeling that uh, in this case, as we just trained with 13 hours, uh, even the language model features are just correcting some pronunciation mismatches. So in order to correct uh, grammar differences, maybe we need more, much more data. And uh, I don't know how much difference there is in grammar uh, of standard American English. And I know I read about some uh, thing, different things that they delayed the copula uh, verb and things like that. Uh, and I actually, I, uh, I was analyzing my data a little bit and uh, looking for these uh, grammar differences. And I annotated a couple, but there were not many. Definitely, I saw a couple of these uh, copula deletion. Um, maybe, I think, some ENG, now I don't remember very well, but there, there, were, there were limited ones, but yes, a couple I saw. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other? Questions from the audience? All right, well, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.